Tonight, more redundancies at the hillside workshops, but it could have been worse. Planning begins for a big Dunedin-based international film contest. And one of Invercargill's best-known choir leaders to leave the stage. Good evening. Dunedin's hillside railway workshops have escaped the brunt of the nationwide redundancies announced today. Although nearly 500 jobs are being lost in the country's workshops, hillside will lose only 20, Jim Moore reports. Promises over the long-term future of hillside have been kept. There'll be disappointment about the fact that 20 employees will be laid off over the next 12 months, but the feeling is that given the current economic situation, things could have been a lot worse. That they aren't is a tribute to the efficiency of the Dunedin operation and the fact that it's won several important contracts recently. The workshops will have a role as a wagon overhaul and construction centre. The construction programme includes CB class bulk load wagons and the foundry and component manufacturing capabilities will be retained. Also underway is construction of 50 new lightweight HK container wagons. Hillside will still be encouraged to tender for engineering work throughout Australasia. Figures just out show that house prices in most of the South's main centres went up during the first six months of the year. The exception was Gore, where the Valuation New Zealand price index dropped by just over half a percent. The region's biggest increase was in Dunedin, where the house price index rose by 3.7 per cent. In Vicargo, Alexandra and Omaru all went up by about 1 per cent. The number of houses sold in the South was slightly down on the previous six months. Dunedin is to host an international wildlife film contest being planned by Television New Zealand. It's designed to fit in with two international wildlife conferences being held in New Zealand in 1990. And organisers hope it will give the Pacific a higher profile in the wildlife film world. Lee Davies was at the planning meeting. I want... The suggestion for the festival came from the International Ornithological Congress, which is to hold its 20th Congress in Christchurch in 1990. It's already informed its members about the festival, and there's been a big indication of interest. Television New Zealand's Natural History Unit is ideally placed to run a Pacific festival, having taken away many awards in Britain's wild screen and a number of other international competitions. And then something which no one before had witnessed. Sequences like this, the first filmed record of a crayfish spawning, recently took the Wild South documentary Tale of the Crayfish into the finals of Wild Screen to be held in Britain in October. More than a hundred inquiries about the New Zealand contest have come in already, with the festival still two years away. Today's annual meeting of the New Zealand Permanent Building Society was told the society's head office will remain in Dunedin. It was pointed out that $1.7 million had recently been spent on extending and refurbishing the head office building in the city. Concern about a possible move away from Dunedin led to intense lobbying before today's meeting over the election of two new directors. The letter-writing campaign run by Dunedin's Alistair Broad proved in unsuccessful. He missed out on the seat. New Zealand women, wherever they live, shouldn't assume that communication breakdowns in doctor-patient relationships were confined to Auckland's National Women's Hospital. That's according to journalist Sandra Coney, co-author of the magazine article that prompted the inquiry into cervical cancer treatment at National Women's. Gaynor Smith talked to her in Dunedin today. It's less than a fortnight since the report of the cervical cancer inquiry came out. Now, Sandra Coney's book, The Unfortunate Experiment, tells how she and Phila de Bunkle worked through their initial journalistic investigation, plus her own version of the inquiry's progress. Her anger about the lack of information given National Women's patients hasn't abated. That showed that our suggestion, relayed from a local doctor, that because cervical cancer is relatively rare, there's a risk women may see it as a bigger threat than is warranted. I think the fact that a doctor said that to you smacks rather of the National Women's line, which reinforces my view that National Women's has had a national influence. One of the tacks they've taken is to say, this isn't a very important disease. People get killed far more often by breast cancer, by road accidents, by poisoning. 
So why do we spend so much time thinking about cervical cancer? The fact is that 200 women a year die of it. It's an awful way to die, and it's an entirely preventable disease. Now, many, many diseases, cancers, are not preventable. This is preventable by a cervical smear, picking up the early stage, which is almost 100% treatable. So I'm, I'm sad that doctors down here have got that sort of attitude about cervical cancer. The fact that breast cancer, say, is more prevalent is immaterial, she says. There's a difference in early diagnosis. Well, the significance is that the early stage of the disease can be picked up by a smear, but that the doctor in this case ignored the smears and let the woman continue with positive smears. Now, with breast cancer, the only way that you can pick it up is by finding a lump or by mammography. So it's not as easily detectable and it's not as easily treatable. But also during the inquiry, a study about breast cancer was raised by Dr Gray at Wellington Hospital where he had very, felt very concerned about the ethics and what was happening to the women and where he had great trouble to try and get some investigation of that particular study. And that was very recent. And it, that was provided as evidence that the sort of problems that the doctors who tried to stop the National Women's Study had encountered um, had been replicated by Dr Gray at Wellington Hospital. So you obviously feel that there are still many problems of communication which haven't been sorted out yet? I think that there are many problems about medical accountability, about doctors improving their attitudes towards the patients. I think there are endless problems in hospitals and I hear about them all the time. So I mean, I'm quite convinced, and Judge Cartwright also spells that out very clearly, that a lot has to improve both in strengthening consumer rights but also in the medical profession putting its own house in order. Has Sandra Coney now really become an advocate for that? Well, yes, I mean, that's what I've been working on for many years and I will continue to do so. At this time of year, young trees get a hiding from wild animals. There's not much else for them to eat. And in many cases, poisoning is either impractical or uneconomic. But as Rob Cope Williams reports, the Forest Research Institute in Christchurch has come up with a novel method of stopping the destruction. Young trees attract attention from many of our wild animals. Possums, rabbits and hares are the worst. Hares nip off the tops while rabbits and possums destroy the plant by eating most of it. Staff at the Forest Research Institute have retaliated by coming up with a recipe that can turn away even the hungriest rodent. Six eggs, 150 mils of acrylic paint and 600 mils of, of water, pint of water, and that makes one litre of solution. So, shall I, shall I make a, a brew for you? But what's the, really the essence to this recipe is that I must beat it very thoroughly first because I've got to apply this through an that square. And if I just whisked it up, perhaps just like making a, an omelette, then in fact it won't go through my square. So what I must now do is give this a thorough beating. You're not really serious about this. You're not, yeah. This isn't really going to be used to, to, to keep animals away. Well, we've tested this solution along with um, a, n a number of other solutions that we can show you on 4,500 trees, and we've been finding extremely good results. There's enough brew here to treat 50 trees. The mixture is sprayed on at a cost of 7 cents a plant. It can be done for 2 cents, but that involves using egg powder and resins which have to be bought in bulk. The Institute has also done trials on other mixtures, mutton fat and kerosene, but that's extremely messy to apply. There's also a fish fertiliser mix, and believe me, that really stinks. The protection from the different mixes lasts for about a month to six weeks, but after a couple of applications, the animals get the message. Once bitten, twice shy, and they're inclined to leave the trees in peace. I'd say... It was a disappointing day for the Southland rugby team. In Blenheim this afternoon, Southland was beaten 31 points to 13 by a fired-up Marlborough side. The second division match saw Marlborough score 25 points in a strong second-half performance. In a third division game, Buller beat North Otago by 18 points to 6. 
A working life deeply involved with music comes to an end soon for a Southland school teacher. Over the past 25 years, thousands of children have benefited from the tuition of Kathleen Sutton, who teaches at Invercargill's Rosedale Intermediate. She retires this year, and it's thought her choir of boy sopranos may disband. <laughs> choir. Kathleen Sutton's had a lot of success polishing the raw talent found in an intermediate school. She specialises in developing boys' voices at the school, where she's taught since it first opened. She'll be conducting her own choir as part of 300 children she'll conduct at tonight's Southland Schools Music Festival. I do enjoy working with them because I feel that often boys' voices are not used to the full and they don't have the opportunities and when there is a solely boys' choir, then there is a good response. And she hopes they'll make a contribution to music like some of her former pupils when their voices deepen. But the school's principal, Paul Ferris, appreciates Kathleen's work with the boys. But what's more grand than getting 40 boys who are not encouraged by their peer group to sing, to sing like they did today? And uh, I think that was wonderful. I don't think there's anything else you could do but give success to children. And that's what Kathleen's done. Peter Crookshank talking with Kathleen Sutton. And before we go, a look at the award-winning mural in Dunedin's Darling Street car park. Art pupils from Otago Girls High School were busy finishing it today. It won a competition run by the City Council and the Keep Dunedin Beautiful Group. And the temperature's now at 3 o'clock today, predicting a high of 6 degrees for Invercargill tomorrow and 9 degrees for Dunedin. The big high today of 17 for Omaru. We'll be back tomorrow night. Good night.